So for our final presentation this evening, I want to remind everyone to keep your phones off, if you can. We have got an uh, esteemed uh, panel here, and our moderator will be Dr. Leila Almariadi. Many of you know her. She's an esteemed physician and Palestinian activist. Please give your attention to Dr. Almariadi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Any problems? Raise your hand if you cannot. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank the Muslim Public Affairs Council for asking me to moderate this panel with such esteemed scholars. I'm a little bit in awe, and I think all of us will really benefit from the conversation we're going to have today. They're here to help us understand a subject that I would say until 20 to 30 years ago was largely theoretical uh, in terms of looking at the role of Islam involved in political movements. The past few years have witnessed great political upheaval throughout much of the Arab and Muslim world, and the role of Islam and Muslim political movements, so-called Islamism, have been viewed simultaneously as threats or as essential components to the process of democratization. At the same time, the role of Islam in governance has already been playing out mostly in non-Arab Muslim countries, such as Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, with mixed results. So to open the conversation, I'm going to ask each panelist to address the question posed as the title of this session. Is there a future for political Islam? While part of the answer is that it may be soon, too soon to tell, we still do want to hear your thoughts about the future in light of current events. The question is very broad, so feel free, uh, feel free to narrow your response as much or as little as you see fit. Just before we get started, um, we may have time for a few questions during this panel. Volunteers will be walking around with cards for you to write your questions, and they will be um, selected and then given to me. So uh, if you do have questions during the discussion, write them towards the beginning if you can. Also, I will just make a, a point now that um, there are also will be volunteers with envelopes um, uh, picking up the envelopes that are on your chairs for donations for the Muslim Public Affairs Council, especially if you're unable to stay this evening for the banquet. So please go ahead and make your contribution as well. You all have the bios of our speakers in your programs, so I'm not going to review them all with you now. Uh, suffice to say that uh, we are uh, really um, in the presence of some great thinkers. Uh, I'm going to start us off to answer the question with uh, Professor Esposito, who is a Professor of Religion and International Affairs and of Islamic Studies at Georgetown, the founding director of the Prince El Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding uh, in the Walsh School of Foreign Service there. He's a very prolific writer, uh, a um, wonderful speaker. He's been on, appeared on many uh, television programs, radio, uh, writes uh, his own articles as well as publishes books. So I think I will start with you, Professor Esposito. Uh, great, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, first of all, to uh, not have any confusion, you will be getting envelopes to contribute to the fundraising, but I also have family members who will be passing out envelopes to contribute to the Espositos. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the topic is very interesting when you said it. it, it if, for some people, the idea of talking about Islamic movements and particularly thinking about them as being uh, somewhat proximate in terms of coming to power uh, was neither believed by most Islamic movements and certainly not by entrenched authoritarian regimes or Western governments. Uh, and so it was part of a general approach uh, that has existed for many, many decades uh, that, that basically would say things like, first of all, uh, the reason why uh, we don't have democracy in the Middle East is uh, that Arab culture or Muslim culture or Islam itself is somehow incompatible with democracy. Um, the other issue that was interrelated to it was the question of Islamic movements or what we call political Islamic movements or Islamists. And you always had two schools of thought. One uh, represented by a whole host of people was that all Islamic movements are the same. You've got terrorists and then you've got those that are wolves in sheep's clothing. So for example, if you are like the Ikhwan in Egypt and for four decades have not engaged in violence, have not responded uh, by, uh, with violence uh, under the Mubarak regime, under Sadat, uh, you know, et cetera, well, that really doesn't matter. It means that somehow you're really not showing your true you know, face. 
Well, all of a sudden we wound up with the Arab Spring, and the Arab Spring refuted a good deal of conventional wisdom. Number one, it demonstrated that young people weren't always go, weren't looking to run after bin Laden, that if given a choice, most young people would take to the streets and would want to see accountable government. It also demonstrated that authoritarian regimes, even to the, to the dismay of authoritarian regimes and their Western allies, uh, were in fact not as stable and secure as everybody believed and could be brought down pretty quickly. It demonstrated that large segments of a population across the spectrum, religious, not religious, young, old, etc., cetera, um, wanted uh, accountable government, wanted the rule of law. But the stunner was when elections were actually held, whereas Islamic movements had not been particularly at the forefront, members had been involved in the uprisings but hadn't been at the forefront of leading at all, they wound up being elected in Egypt and also in Tunisia. The question of the future, of course, of political Islam has been precipitated by the failures of the Morsi government and by the coup and by what has occurred post-coup, uh, which is the reassertion of an authoritarian regime with violence. Uh, and let me be very blunt about this in terms of my own position. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was a mainstream movement and it screwed up. But so did George W. Bush. And depending on what your politics are, you may think that Obama did, et cetera. Uh, but certainly for those of us that had a problem with Bush's foreign policies, with a lot of his you know, domestic policies, uh, et cetera, there were issues. The question is, from a, de a democracy point of view, how do you make that transition? Um, and, and I think that's a real issue. It's, it's, it's a major issue today uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, it's a major issue in many of the countries, and it's a major issue with regard to the Gulf countries. So I would say that, that, first of all, Islam in politics is going to be around for a long time because of the nature of Muslim societies. That's going to be the case. Now, how that's going to be adapted, are you going to have secular governments that somehow also acknowledge the role of Islam in governance while still having a, uh, a civil uh, uh, government and society in which all citizens are equal? Will you take the position that Anahta has taken, for example, in Tunisia uh, and have a uh, multi-party system uh, and indeed uh, insist that all citizens have, have, have equal rights? Will you have the failed approach of the Egyptian uh, Muslim Brotherhood? Will you have the problem of the jihadists in Syria? Uh, those are the real concerns. And, and how much has what happened in Egypt, will that affect radicalization in some parts of political Islam? But the role of Islam in society and politics will be there in many countries. The last point I would make is that the other question you want to ask yourself is what about democracy and the rule of law? The people who have committed the most violence in Egypt, quantitatively, are in fact the military and, and the government that's in. So the real test is going to be to see whether or not the next government is simply an extension of Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak, or whether it implements a more open-minded democracy. If that doesn't happen, then you have a return to authoritarianism. And we clearly see that authoritarianism has been reinforced in the Gulf states many of which have been very active uh, in uh, uh, working against many of the Islamist governments because of the fear of the democracy wave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mavani. <laughs> professor uh, Mavani is a professor of uh, religion and Islamic studies, and uh, we're looking forward to his most recent book called The Religious, Religious Authority and Political Thought in Twelver Shiaism from Ali to Khomeini. So, Professor. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I think there are certain assumptions made when you talk about political Islam or Islamic State, Islam and politics, that somehow there is a, a prescribed formula or a prescribed template of formulating an Islamic State or an Islamic government or the role of politics in Islam. What I want to argue is that Islam has become inflated. Islam has become too bloated. In a sense, that Islam is portrayed as an entity that addresses each and every aspect of human life, social, political, economic, religious, ethical. There is no aspect of human life, it is argued by some, where Islam does not have a prescription. And the argument that I have is that that kind of an Islam is non-existent. Why do I say so? Because if you look at the Quran, 
Quran is not a manual or, or, or a monograph on establishing a manifesto of Islamic State. Only 10% of the Holy Quran addresses issues dealing with what we would call injunctions, punishments, uh, contracts, marriage, inheritance, uh, shura. Shura by itself does not constitute Islamic State. Shura is a general principle of consultation, but it in no way gives us a formula of how to establish or what constitutes, what are the components of an Islamic State. And this assumption is built into our discourse. When we talk about post, uh, what is going to happen to the political parties, uh, it is a built-in assumption that somehow there has to be an impingement of political aspect into, directly into the role of an, a, a state. As Professor Esposito mentioned, that this is not the norm. In the early days, the standard was that these two entities were separate. The ulama were separate, and the state was also run by somebody who was not a, a legal scholar, a jurist, but the ulama had certainly influence, and they used to give advice. This amalgamation of these two entities is an experimental phase, and I don't think it has produced very positive results so far. Why do I say so? Take the example of Iran. You know, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini came to power in 1979, and he said, well, I want to establish social justice, economic justice, political justice. And gradually, as the government began to roll on, he realized that we don't have enough resources to talk about an economic policy. We don't have enough resources to talk about you know, social policies. And there's nothing wrong in it. You know, the Quran has given us universal general principles which we can use to develop an economic theory. Look at how much discussion goes on about riba, about interest or usury, and we haven't yet come to a solution. Now, if you can't come to a solution on usury that is used in the current monetary system, how do you expect to have a formula of governing an Islamic state systematically, methodically, as a structured entity? You see what I'm saying? Is that these kinds of things have been left for public discourse, for public choice, a civil society. And therefore, I would argue is that the future of political Islam or, or political parties in the Muslim world is not very, um, it's, it's, it's bleak. Why do I say so? The reason being is that there has been this idealized vision, this romanticized vision, that if only we can have Islamic parties in power, all the problems of the world will be gone. It's a panacea, Islam who will help. Have you heard this? Islam who will help. Islam is the panacea, Islam is the universal solution. If only we had Islam, whatever that nebulous entity is, we don't know what that Islam is, okay? But there is this romanticized vision that we can go back in our history in the golden era, and Dr. Hatut would say there is no golden era, right? Um, so, so the argument is this, is that the future of political Islam is bleak, why? because in the experimental phase, in the romanticized vision, is going to be shattered. And we are seeing this. Iran was a good case. After more than 30 years, it has been a total failure. Failure as, an Islam, as, a, as a state, and failure also in the terms of Islamic governance. They have, what has happened is, by the involvement of ulama in politics, the Iranian population, especially the young folks, have become disillusioned with religion. They don't want to have anything to do with Islam because they think anything that goes wrong in Islam has to do with, uh, with religion. So what I would argue is what Professor Bayat has argued is that we are entering a phase of post-Islamism. That is to say is that this phenomena of Islamic State uh, will gradually become eroded and develop into a new phenomena of what we would call post-Islamism what Professor Esposito argued, a form of a, maybe a secular society where religion has a role to play. Thank you. Very interesting. Do you mind handing the mic to <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, next, we have Harun Mogul, who is a fellow in uh, Muslim politics and societies at the Center on National Security at Fordham Law School. He is a columnist for Arabia English. Uh, I saw a recent article he wrote. Uh, comparing uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to 
Recep Erdogan, which he probably didn't score brownie points with some people, but uh, nevertheless, I think it was, it was really spoke to some of these issues about whether or not this model is on the wane, and, and Turkey certainly is an example that a lot of people look to, but we welcome your thoughts on the, the subject. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, I grew up in rural Massachusetts uh, where there was no one like me. I wasn't just a minority, I was a minority of one. Uh, the things that I was passionate about, the things that moved me, the people that inspired me, the people that I cheered for, uh, were not usually uh, people that my classmates and peers were familiar with or understood. And I felt marginalized in this way until last night when I saw something walking not far from here uh, with some friends. I don't know if Ahmed's in the audience, but he was there. Uh, it was a sign outside of a bar and uh, stopped me cold. I'd never seen anything like it and I, I didn't really know what to do with it, so I just kind of filed it away and thought what better place to discuss what I saw outside of a bar than a Muslim convention. It's clearly I think in advance before I speak. If you're used to being in a minority and you frame yourself as a minority, sometimes you don't know what to do when you realize you are or you find yourselves in the majority. Growing up in rural Massachusetts, I was used to being the kid who was picked on. Because you see, this was the 1980s, and I was a Lakers fan. <laughs> That's right. So last night, we're walking to a Lebanese restaurant, and I see a sign. It says, come watch the Lakers game tonight. And I was like, oh my god. Never seen that before. I grew up in Celtics country, right? That was like enemy territory. Uh, you don't want to know what I went through wearing a Lakers t-shirt walking around. And the reason I bring that up is because I think that political Islam as we understand it, was an answer to a question whose time has passed. Muslims, I think, have trouble knowing what to do with power, broadly speaking. We are more comfortable in a frame of victimhood, even when that doesn't apply. And it's funny because historically speaking, for at least a thousand years, Islam informed culturally dominant understandings of the world. Right? We were, in the colloquial term, the man. Right? The man was brown. Right? So like, that, that is kind of confusing to us because we often frame ourselves as minorities on the margins, on the fringes. And political Islam to me sometimes represents, it's kind of like you get dressed up for a desi party and you show up and when you make it, you're so late that everyone is left. Right? Like, which is really epic for a desi. And like one out of six of you are desi, and two out of six of you smell like it. So it's okay. I'm just kidding. Um, it's you know, and I don't even know what that means. Um, what I mean to say is that political Islam was formed at a time when the nation state was the center of authority, and it was framed through the lens of Cold War conflict and the assumption of a dominant West. It has emerged in the wake of the Arab Spring into a world where states don't have quite the same kind of power they used to. And the world is fragmented around forms of authority between institutions, corporations, economic processes, the rise of the global south, the formation of the European Union, and these sorts of processes which I think unsettle everyone and make it hard to know how to move forward. So what I think I would say just very briefly in, to answer this is I think that political Islam is exactly as, as we've been hearing in the, in the process of, of going somewhere. And it's about coming to terms with the fact that people are now in charge of their destiny. After the coup in Egypt, right, who supported the military regime of Sisi? Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, right? The United States didn't really know what to do with the coup. We fumbled and made some negative gestures and some positive gestures. We didn't really know what to do. But the GCC jumped into the breach with billions of dollars to shore up Egypt. Right? The Middle East is now entering a phase where it is increasingly responsible for its own destiny, 
And that means the good of it and the bad of it. Thank you very much. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, all three of you. Um, on the one hand, as Professor Esposito says, political Islam and these movements are, are here to stay. They're part of the landscape, even if so far their track record on multiple fronts uh, has not been successful. There must be the hope or aspiration that if we just have another chance, we'll get it right. Whereas what you're arguing, Professor Mavani, is their whole understanding of the concept is wrong to begin with. And therefore, no matter what path you take, eventually when you're trying to marry these two things together, you will fail because it's not possible. And as you're pointing out, uh, Harun, as well, that, that it's almost as if we're talking something that exists in a current time and place, as opposed to a general subject that there always has been and always will be political Islam. Rather, it formed as a result of uh, geopolitical realities in the Middle East and the, throughout the Muslim world, post-colonialism, and so forth. So that kind of leaves me feeling like, I, I don't know what the future is. <laughs> Um, and in terms of the conversation, one of the subjects that I have been thinking about in this discussion uh, is an area that have, has always been of importance to me, that relates to the treatment of women, and similarly to the treatment of minorities in Muslim countries. Um, and part of the biggest fear of these Muslim political movements is they get that part wrong every time. Um, speaking of, you talked about some other scholars, I was looking through my library and I happened to have Olivier Roy's book, of The Failure of Political Islam, written in 1996, and your book, Islam and Democracy, in 1994, uh, where you talk about how d democratization is a difficult and messy process, that's how it was in the West, it didn't happen overnight, are we, are we ahead of ourselves by questioning this right now? And he also paints the picture of all these movements are the same, this idea, like you said, of the wolf in sheep's clothing. But when it comes to treatment of women, is it because of their failed understanding of what Islam really says, or is this as good as it can get? When it comes to attitude towards not just religious minorities, but ethnic minorities, and when I talk about religious minorities, I'm talking about inter-Muslim conflict, whether you're Ahmadis in Pakistan, or Shias in Saudi Arabia, um, or Sufis in some other parts, are we able to overcome these things in a way to have a, a society that embraces all members, including those on the fringe whose ideas are, are looked at negatively? And of course, the unspoken group that we usually don't bring up at most conferences are people who are of a different sexual orientation. The fact remains they all are citizens and members of a society. And is it possible for a so-called Islamic political movement to embrace them all and elevate them to the same status of everyone else? I know that's a big question, but I feel like it, it may be at the crux of some of the things uh, people look at. So you can start. <coughs> just, just quickly, um, to begin with, the, uh, the uh, status of women and the extent to which uh, women are victims um, is not primarily caused by political Islam. It's caused by a good deal of centuries of patriarchal mainstream Islam. And that continues to be the case in many countries. Uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, it's not really simply, you know, uh, Wahhabi Islamic movements. It's the royal family when it comes to the most minor of concerns, which is driving a car compared to other issues that women you know, face in, in Muslim society. So I think one has to realize here we're talking about as in Islam, as in Judaism, as in Christianity, religions that grow up out of a patriarchal past in which the good old boys also are the interpreters of religion have therefore a, a very patriarchal and therefore a, a problem from the point of view of gender relations in the 20 and 21st century. Islamist movements then can contribute to that problem, especially when they have this hard and fast approach. You know, uh, you know, one of the dangers though, is, and it's not just with Islamist movements, you see it with many uh, American Muslims and other Muslims, they talk more about Islam than they do about the Quran. Islam says, and as soon as they say that, it means my interpretation of Islam, but it's really not that they're saying it's my interpretation, it's Islam says. And that's exactly what your uh, hardcore movement would. W when you look at Islamist movements, though, in terms of 
the progressive versus those that aren't. I would say that if you look at uh, the AK Party and the role of women in Turkey, for example, in the last 10 years in parliament and education, etc., and if you look also at uh, the Anakta movement and the role of women uh, in the parliament, uh, in Tunisia, et cetera, that stands in sharp contrast to many of the, the more, what I would call, ultra-conservative uh, Islamist movements. Mm -hmm. the, but on the issue of, again, the, the question of religious minorities, wh what people block out is it's not a matter of saying, for example, okay, what happened to women when Morsi came in versus some other time? The fact is, uh, I'm sorry, not women, I mean religious minorities. Mm -hmm. The fact is, sadly, in the last few years, from North Africa to Southeast Asia, there have been problems between, uh, uh, with religious minorities. That is, in the way religious minorities have been handled, in the way Christian minorities have been handled. And in some countries that we wouldn't have expected. The situation in Malaysia has gotten worse rather than, not, rather than better. And it didn't look like the kind of country where that would, where that would happen. And, and, it, and it's, it's true in terms of the situation of minorities in, in Pakistan and other places. But then it gets compounded by the fact that the, the, if you will, the exclusivist religious folk, okay, they're really very Catholic in approach, small c, not my tribe, small c. Uh, and that is that, in fact, they don't leave any space for other Muslims. And so we've seen a lot of conflict in many of these countries, not only with Christians, but also vis-a-vis -vis other Muslims. And that gets into, again, it seems to me, uh, uh, having to deal with reform, which is what I talk about in my, my, my book, The Future of Islam, mm -hmm. where, where one needs to find religious leaders, not only those that we call progressive, but even those that are more traditional in their methodology, who may argue differently methodologically, but come out with a reformist approach in terms of issues like women and minorities. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, in, in terms of, I guess, I'll, I'll look at religious minorities and just minorities in general, I think the Arab world is, has a serious problem right now. Um, the only Arab country left of any weight is Saudi Arabia. And that's the problem, because it's Saudi Arabia. Iraq is a disaster. Syria is facing a humanitarian catastrophe that's just of, of terrible scope and scale. Egypt is not going to be a factor on the world stage for a very long time, I'm sorry to say, but Egypt, is, uh, Egypt has become basically indebted to countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. It cannot support itself, and it's ruled by a military class that, according to a WikiLeaks cable, uh, is, quote, no longer capable of combat. Uh, so, you know, in, in the estimation of the U.S. government, the Egyptian military is not even a military. It's just basically a, a predator class that, that has you know, bankrupted the country over the last 50 or 60 years and seen it become increasingly less important. Uh, Tunisia shows some signs of hope, but Tunisia is a small country. And one of the downsides to the death of political Islam is that it comes in the death of these great narratives, which means there is on the ground in a lot of the Arab world and in a lot of the Muslim world, no great narratives that aim at bringing people together. Right? You're seeing this collapse into ever more xenophobic, sectarian, fragmented, micro-identities. Uh, the degree of hostility I saw, for example, I spent most of the last year in the Gulf and the Middle East, towards Muslims and Arabs of slightly different identity or characteristic or whatever you want to call it, dialect, was simply shocking. I mean, people banding around, you know, sort of the Shia, the Shia are all heretics, yeah, not even understanding what a Shia Muslim is. I mean, beyond the ignorance, there's ignorance, right? So it, it's really alarming because how do you change that? You have to find something that inspires people to reach beyond their immediate circumstances. The implosion of the rebellion in Syria into what is becoming a, a kind of multi-pronged civil war with ever more radical factions is just a reflection of what's happening across a lot of the Muslim world. And, you know, when we were talking about the Brotherhood, for example, and some of its failures in governance, the more alarming thing to me is the degree to which people who you would have thought were more open-minded and generous in their approach in Egypt, sort of the liberal secular class as they're called, turn sort of rabidly xenophobic towards their own citizens within the space of a year. And I don't have an easy answer to that. 
But I think in order to address the problem, we have to be honest about the scope and scale of it. And I think something like Ak Party is unusual insofar as it has built a coalition that has brought people together. I don't see a lot of hope in the near term for the types of people who are stepping forward to try to do that. I think Pakistan is another case in point. It's just fragmentation upon fragmentation upon fragmentation. Professor Mazzani. Yeah. Um, the, the issues that you raised, Dr. Mariachi, I think they are really the crux of the issues of the serious problems that we would have under so-called Islamic State. Of course, we all agree that the Islamic State is not a uniform concept. Uh, there are different versions of what we would call an Islamic State. If there is such a notion, I want to argue that there is no such notion even in existence, <coughs> notion of an Islamic State. And if you have time in your hands, read the book of Professor Wael Halak. It's called The Impossible State. And he argues in a similar, he argues, but from a different vantage point, why it is not possible to have an Islamic state in modernity. It is just not feasible. In a modern nation state, you cannot have an Islamic state, period. That's his argument. And he systematically, progressively develops it uh, very articulately. Now, on the issue that you mentioned, you know, we have a dictum in Islamic law that everything is permissible except those things that have been explicitly prohibited, right? On the ultra-conservative side, <coughs> they would reverse the dictum. They would say everything is prohibited unless it has been explicitly approved by Islam. You can see the contrast in terms of their vision of what Islamic law is all about. The issues that were raised on issues of gender, issues of minority rights, issues of freedom of religion, issues like apostasy, a person who changes religion voluntarily out of conviction from Islam to another religion, these notions, the universality of human rights, the concept of universal dignity, all these concepts, one can argue, would be impossible under what you may call an Islamic state unless you are prepared to engage in what Professor Esposito mentioned, a, a serious ijtihad, a serious reform of tajdeed, a serious renewal. And if you do this serious renewal, you are not going to have an Islamic state, you will have a civil society. A civil society where there is ethics coming from religion, from Islam, but the society is much more of a democratic nature where the public will, will decide what will be the form of government. Why do I say so? Because if you look at the Quran, and the Quran has given us the law of inheritance in Al-Baqarah. It says, upon death, you are going to allocate the share of your estate in this particular formula. One eighth for so and so, one sixth, right? It's a very long ayah, very long verse. Now, it is impossible under the existing Islamic state theory, Islamic law, for anyone to change the law of inheritance. It is going to remain, the ratio is going to remain two to one. The boy will get twice the share in general compared to the, uh, to the girl. Okay, I have a son and a daughter, it's gonna be a big fight, you know? <laughs> uh, it is impossible to resolve this issue. If you, stay, if you stick to this principle that whatever is explicit in the Quran and unambiguous is not subject to change. It is not historically conditioned. It is not contextually bound. It is static. Once you have taken that position, you cannot have concept of citizenship. You can't have universality of human rights under any so-called Islamic state. Whatever your Islamic state may be, unless you are prepared to engage, like I said, in serious reform. And serious reform means that you have a system of governance that is a civil society where you have equality of rights and there is a public discourse going on and the public will decide what the final formula will be. Gender rights cannot be resolved. It's just impossible. Ask any jurist, Sunni or Shia, and tell him, no matter how progressive he or she may be, Shis are very few, by the way. It is mostly a male-dominated uh, discourse. In any event, <clears throat> you ask any scholar, even uh, 
Sheikh Al Qaradawi, let's say, or Dr. Ghanoushi, a very progressive in, in Sunnism, in Shiism, asked, for example, Ayatollah Sani and Ayatollah uh, Bujnurdi and so on. What is, the, what is the judgment on a person, on a Muslim, who converts from Islam to another religion out of conviction? So let's say he's a Muslim and then he does research in Christianity and says, you know what? Christianity is so much in tune with my uh, spiritual makeup. And he wants to convert. What is the Islamic prescription on such a person? What do you think they would argue? People like Sheikh Al-Qarad. I'm not asking about the traditional scholars. We know the answer. What do you think these progressive scholars would argue, progressive jurists? What would they say? What is his judgment? Is it OK that he can convert from one faith to another, from Islam to another faith? Death penalty. The, yeah, exactly. The response will be standard. Death penalty. In Shia Islam, they give you three days. Within those three days, they say, make up your mind. Otherwise, we are coming after you. <laughs> and they say, do it out of free will. Well, if I know that you are coming after me after three days, what free will do I have? <laughs> OK? Islamic legal system has become law of expediency. Whatever is most convenient and most pragmatic becomes Islamic law, but doesn't have any kind of coherence. I was giving the example of Iran of more than 30 years. Ayatollah Khomeini had this vision, and probably he truly believed in this, that he can establish a true Islamic state. He realized very shortly thereafter, we don't have the necessary tools developed to talk about this kind of an economic system, a political system, or social system. We have principles, but we don't have prescribed template. And, and what happened as a result? Ayatollah Khomeini said, I'm going to invoke maslaha. What is maslaha? Public welfare. Before his death, he argued that whatever is in the public interest, I will dictate that to be the Sharia. You see what happened? Rather, Sharia was supposed to govern the Islamic State. Now what Ayatollah Khomeini came to the conclusion, because he realized that he doesn't have the necessary tools, he said, you know what? Whatever I dictate as a supreme jurist is going to become known as the Sharia. Because it is in public interest, it is in part of the maslaha, public welfare. Public welfare has become <clears throat> something very pragmatic. There is no methodology. You may say this is public welfare. I will say, no, it is not in public interest. Nothing happens. It is not a structured methodology. And therefore, what I want to argue is that maslaha has become the rule under Islamic State. Why? Not because they want to manipulate us. It's because Islam has not addressed this issue. They are the issue, what we would call, where Islam has not given an injunction. Islam has not given us a formula of an Islamic State. It gives us general principles, and it's okay, it's up to you now. You decide, for example, Allama Iqbal would say we should have a parliamentary system, part of ishtihad. Well, this I think is perhaps what we can argue is that as the experimental phase of these Islamic parties ends, because like I said, they're living in the honeymoon phase right now, they have been untested. Once they go through this phase of being tested, like it was done in the Shia world, you will see that the charm will go away, and there is going to be somehow a recourse to either maslaha, what is in public interest, or a, a formula of what we would call a civil society that is somehow fused with democracy, uh, with religious ethics, and so and so, but not what we would call an Islamic state governed by religious scholars. Well, um you know, these issues make me think sometimes of the argument that others have that what we may be arguing about is trying to impose an outside system on Islam and Muslims. And perhaps there are those that would say, it's fine if we don't resolve this uh, disparity in inheritance. It's fine that we keep this punishment for the apostate according to what the hadith is. And yes, that is what we want when we say we have an Islamic movement or Islamic political party. The trouble is that they can't establish consensus and they probably will not, in a democratic system, be given the opportunity to uh, 
to impose that on everyone, and that's usually the argument against these groups. One man, one vote, one time, and then they'll have the opportunity to put their vision in place. But even then, it's not as stable as you're pointing out with Iran. Um, so, so we could make the ideological argument that it's, it's not uh, a valid system for governance, but yet it exists. And is it something that could evolve in its current form, or does it have to simply dissolve for, for people to go to this place of what we've, we are saying is what we all aspire to, which is civil society that represents a certain universality of rights that not everyone takes for granted. Are, are we really on two different pages here? And one of the questions that came from the audience relates to whether uh, Sharia law is compatible with the Constitution. This is a general and a broad question, but it sort of speaks to this idea that I'm talking about as to whether the ideal is coming from the outside. Is this something that can grow from within an understanding of Islam? Um, and is it something that we as, not only as Muslims, but as human beings can evolve into? To, to, to make it a better uh, government or society depending on what country we're talking about. We could look at Turkey. Are they moving in a direction that is a natural evolution of this process if you let it go on its own? Will it be something like Iran that can't go anywhere, as you say, and it just has to end and, and start all over? Uh, it, are Egypt and Tunisia, you know, they could be examples of something that's just in the middle of a process that's taking place. Is it possible to evolve in this whole discussion? I'll start with Haroon and then Professor Esposito. Um, so I, I think uh, the, the interesting question for us is, I think what, what Islam is trying to do, and, and speaking as like a, an entire tradition, is ask what does it mean to be a human being? Mm -hmm. What is the value of human life? What is the purpose of human life? Uh, and what are the ideal conditions in which we live our lives? And there are various answers to this, but I think the challenge in the Muslim world is fundamentally, how do we come to terms with the incredibly violent nature of democracy? Because democracy, generally speaking, is only established through horrific amounts of bloodshed. Ethnic cleansing, population transfer, genocide. There's very few democracies anywhere in the world that have not emerged without spectacular bouts of bloodletting, right? Who used to live here, right, and who no longer does? The interesting challenge in a place like Egypt, for example, and let's pretend the coup didn't happen for a second, frame it in American history. It's 1787, you've decided the Articles of Confederation aren't working, and you wanna come up with a constitution. But you already have the assumption that all human beings should be equal, right? Not just all propertied white males, but all human beings. We probably wouldn't have a country. If you asked men, women, slaves, free blacks, Native Americans, everybody who lived from the Mississippi to the Eastern Seaboard to vote on a constitution, would we be able to pull it off? And would it look anything like the Constitution we have today? This is the challenge. The challenge before the Muslim world, I think, generally speaking, is to ask, are we willing, as Dr. Esposito said, to come to some kind of consensus and therefore create hybrid models which are, properly speaking, neither secular nor Islamist, but something muddled in between? which may be inefficient and weird and not ideal from a secular materialist point of view, but nevertheless prevent violence, right? Or do we go the route of violence? And you have two options, either civil war, interminably, or one side crushes the other. That's what the liberal elite of Egypt basically agreed to do. They lined up behind Sisi and the military, and you know, more blood was shed in three months of Sisi's you know, redemption of democracy than in the Muslim Brotherhood's one year of power. That's the challenge, is you have two options here, and how do you weigh them out? So the question of evolution is, I think, a pertinent one. And it's a very difficult one. I'm not, I'm not trying to underestimate what this means, but this is really what these societies have to come to terms with. Uh, 
the other option is for the Muslim world to go through what happened in Europe, which in many cases meant redrawing borders or removing people to make borders more convenient. Even in the case of India, which has had a reasonably resilient democracy, again, you had a partition and horrific amounts of bloodshed. And then within Pakistan, you had another partition and horrific amounts of bloodshed. And you have these sort of cycles of violence. So the question really is, if the people are to be sovereign, who gets to decide who the people are? Mm. Right? And in Iraq, for example, we've seen that there is this form of an answer. Basically, enough Sunni, Shia, and Kurdish Iraqis did not see themselves as sufficiently similar as to be able to cooperate. Now, obviously, the invasion plays into that, but I, I think these are the questions that are really going to get the heart of it. And I don't think there's easy answers to any of these questions. And I think the most promising route has been in Tunisia, where you've seen from Nahda an attempt to kind of bring all the parties to the table. In Egypt, I think there were some muddled moves in that direction, but it didn't work out. And now they've sort of gone back to square one or maybe before that. Just very quickly to reinforce uh, what was just said. If you think about the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the amount of bloodshed, and think that in America, it, it's even more than that. There were more people killed in the Civil War than the American Revolution. And so then when, how many centuries did it take before we actually got the democracy that our founding fathers wanted, and particularly when it comes to the enfranchisement of women and of uh, African Americans, okay? You start with that. The second thing is that when we talk about democracy and its implementation, the fact is religion has played a significant role in Europe. Less so now, but when I was growing up, the whole idea was, well, we in the West have democracy. Big difference between American notion of separation of church and state and many European countries that had a state religion where the state supported the state religion, its schools, its where, where citizens, whether they were believers or not, went to church or not, had to pay a tax and that still exists in, in some countries. So there are different kinds of even modernities there. You know, we always made it like it's the West. And, and there is a notion that, 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 that has been out here for about 30 or 40 years now of multiple modernities, which means therefore you have accommodations are decided within a society based on the context of that society. It's religious makeup, it's ethnic makeup, it's tribal makeup, it's traditions. So there's a lot of wiggle room here. And, and I think that that's very important. On the, on the question of religion, the fact is that uh, I'm a bit of a historian of religions. I'm trained in four religions. If you want to make sure you're marketable, years ago, you make sure you can do four. One isn't enough. <laughs> and the fact is that historically, what you see is that all religions have a plasticity to them. This is true for Islam as it developed. You know, you, you can't say what an Islamic government is structurally, historically, or a Christian or whatever, because most of them wound up reinforcing monarchies, feudalism, etc. And then time moves on and you go through that process. I think what we see since the late 19th century in Muslim countries is an attempt among some intellectuals and reformers to move that way, but structurally that can happen when you have countries that have existed under European rule, and then when they get their independence, they're under authoritarian regimes. So that space hasn't existed. Once that space is in place, then you can get the, 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 the flexibility that exists in religion to adjust to different contexts. I just have to tell you briefly, I asked one of my students, brilliant student, a Kuwaiti once, I said, so how do you view the Salafis in Kuwait? And she said, oh, you mean no, no Islam. I mean, it gets into what you were talking about, you know? It's that kind of version. It's, it's a very un, unattractive version. It's religion is, is about all the no's, you know? Or as I like to say to people, your God is too small. So I, I think that a lot is going to really depend on where the societies go. And I'm not very optimistic in the short term because I see a resurgence or reinforcement and retrenchment of authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. You know, what the Gulf states have managed to do is make for even greater security states now, okay? They're far more securitized than they were before. And with regard to others, mm -hmm. if you're teaching in universities or you apply for a job from one Arab country to another, you have to be cleared by security to get in. And if you come from certain countries, you're not gonna get in unless you're an exception. The Gulf states are interfering in other parts of the world where they're going to reinforce some form of 
authoritarian rule, or they'd like to, to get that stability, you know, in countries like Egypt, or even in a country like Tunisia. So at the end of the day, if that doesn't happen, that restricts the space mm. of even uh, intellectual development, religious development, and it gets tricky in that you see the way religion gets co-opted. Note when a Sisi posed, when he declared power, he had the Pope of the Coptic Church, he had a major imam, a major Salafi leader. The fact is this wasn't done because the Sisi is, you know, saying, come let us all reason together. And, I, I, and here I don't want to make just as a, as a negative Assisi comment, although I can be very negative about Assisi. The fact is American presidents have done that when it comes to religion, but if you have an authoritarian regime, rather than a, in a democracy, there's even more of a risk that the state winds up controlling and influencing the religion. But before we get to you, Professor Mavani, I'm going to um, bring the next question because it, it continues in the same light and, and addresses some of the things that you were talking about as well. Um, it says, aren't we narrowing the framework of this discussion by pointing the finger at people's warped interpretations of Islam? The lack of a true understanding of Islam is a result of, in this person's opinion, economic, political, and intellectual repression, not the opposite. So that if people had freedom, they would have come with a different understanding of Islam. Is that correct? Aren't we failing to acknowledge the role of foreign governments in the suppression of civil society in the Middle East? Which is a question that often comes out. Why is the Middle East in the state it's in? And when you go back historically and look, and, and all of you are, are very knowledgeable on that, how much of that is responsible for the state that we're in today? Uh, and is that really why people have not been able to think of Islam in different terms because of the overall repressive nature of society? Um, very important points and I think very astute points. It is true that the, there are pow other powers uh, at play um, you know, who certainly interfere in the process of developing uh, a systematic and a stable regime, a stable state. Uh, it is undoubtable. Uh, so the influence and the, the phenomena of this anti-Westernism, anti-Americanism, and why many people drift towards this dogmatic and ultra-conservative kind of religion is because they find this sense of comfort that these people are standing up against these uh, invaders and the crusaders and so on. So they, it's, it's exploited. And certainly, you know, uh, the outside powers do not in any way assist. Uh, it, it is true. And I think I don't have an issue with that. Uh, however, the notion of that somehow if you can only understand true Islam, the way he or she mentioned, I think that is the, the, the crux of the issue. There is no such notion as true, original, genuine, you know, unadulterated Islam. From the time the Prophet died, true Islam vanished. I mean, Dr. Hattud would agree with me. Where is, I, mean, I thought you would clap. Okay, anyways, you don't want to clap? Okay. True Islam. <laughs> we don't have any more an authority who is divinely gifted by the grace of revelation to tell us what is that true Islam. It is now left for public and human interpretation, hermeneutics, that is going to be subjective by definition. True Islam is gone. There are various pluralistic brands of Islam, and we can have a discussion about what that Islam is all about. We can discuss, we can sit down, and sit down in a space that is safe. Sister Khadija was saying we need this safe space where HIV, you know, uh, uh, individuals can talk about these issues. We don't have safe zones, unfortunately, in the Muslim communities where we can talk about serious issues without being reprimanded or denounced or excommunicated. And until we have that sense of freedom to really discuss about real issues and disagree with each other and have a sense of humility, intellectual humility, that is to say is that we should not say only so and so knows everything because he is from, I don't know, shall I take names? He is from Azhar. Or I don't know, he is from uh, uh, Harvard. Or he is, there's no such notion. There has to be this sense of humility that we can all sit down together and discuss about issue and come up with a formula that is going to be a feasible formula in the spirit of the Quranic worldview. It doesn't have to be exactly you know, prescriptive, but in the spirit of Quranic worldview. The danger is this in the hybrid model. In the hybrid model, it could be a patchy solution. 
that is not coherent. For the sake of convenience, you bring different things into the formula, your methodology becomes adulterated, like what we have in Sunni Islam, the talfiq. You take something from Hanbali, something from, I don't know, Hanafi, something, and you have all this hodgepodge. You don't have any more structured methodology to address real issues, and the hybrid has that particular hazard, the danger that you are going to have to pick and choose selectively based upon your own preference and then define. Let me give you an example. The issue of, I mentioned interest, riba is a big issue, right? Many of these monarchs who spend you know, public treasury and waste money, but they're very concerned about riba. We should not have any kind of accounts where they're giving us interest, but uh, let there be bloodshed there, that's fine. It's very, you know, it's something wrong in our understanding. Human blood can be shed, but on tiny issues, we are so obsessed. On what day should I cut my nails? Do you know what day is good for you? You are not good, good Muslim. No, it's Sunnah. You don't know Sunnah then. We have become so disoriented from real issues to petty issues. Let me give you an example. Riba is a big issue in Sunni and Shi'i Islam. They say, okay. We know the Quran says categorically that riba is haram and if you take riba, you are fighting against God. Well, riba depends upon how you interpret. Riba, I would say, means usurious, exploitative interest, like what Visa would charge or MasterCard or American <laughs> Express. That's called riba, okay? How much? 24%, okay, that's riba. <laughs> but for example, if a bank, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. we can you have collect to turn your, credit in your credit cards. cards at the end of the Professor session. Professor Esposito said, <laughs> "We'll be doing you we'll pay for an Islamic favor, <laughs> saving you from sin." Yeah. Uh, so it's a big issue. How do we resolve it? Okay, the Quran has said something. This is my reading. You can read differently. My reading is that what the Quran is saying is that you should not be exploiting another human being. That means don't charge him a usurious high interest rate. But if you just want to have a normal yield in your, uh, on your asset, like for example, if the bank lends you some money and says we'll charge you 4%, 5%, this is the opportunity cost. They are taking a risk in us by giving us money and they have every right to charge us in return some kind of an interest rate that has been predetermined. The issue of riba is that it is predetermined ahead of time. If it is done later on, that's fine. So for example, in some Muslim countries where they don't have riba, they will say like this. We are going to give you guaranteed 10%, but then there is going to be some profit, like 2%. They call it profit, but they know ahead of time it's 12%. Okay, but they call it profit sharing. This is the, high, this is the danger of, of trying to adapt where it is not, no more adaptable. I fully agree, Professor Esposito mentioned, that the beauty of Islam is that it has a lot of elasticity, it has a lot of flexibility, it has a lot of creativity within, built into the Islamic universal principles and norms. The issue is this, is that if you as a legal scholar, you put your you know, fist down and say, this is Islam because this is what has been said in the Quran unambiguously, then you can't come out as issue. How do you resolve it? Yes, okay. I will lend you a thousand dollars without interest. Interest is haram, astaghfirullah. Mm -hmm. But I, as a good Muslim, will lend you a thousand bucks, a thousand dollars. In return, you're gonna give me back the principal. At the same time, you see this handkerchief? I'm selling you this handkerchief for two hundred dollars. <laughs> so when you pay me, you have to also pay me for the handkerchief. This is now perfectly legitimate. It is perfectly sorry lawful. To, to interrupt you, Professor Mavani, I've been given the five-minute notice. So, okay, sorry. so, sorry. <laughs> um, but I, I have think, many other jokes. <laughs> um, and I would say that perhaps the audience didn't respond when you said, you know, true Islam died when the Prophet did. Was said it's it's a little bit shocking to think of that, and I think it's kind of sad when we imagine that as well. And so, for us to adjust to that notion and. And really, the discussion today has sort of shaken up some of the things that we all might take for granted, uh, especially the possibility of the good that we ha wish could come of a so-called Islamic state. And I think part of what we have to do is, is understand we don't have the tools to achieve that. There are so many other 
problems involved that perhaps that wishful thinking really is something for us to, to, to do away with. I'm going to just finish up with one more question for Haroon and then I'll have uh, Dr. Esposito give us some closing final remarks. Um, and this is, a uh, person directs this to you, um, Haroon. Given issues of coexistence, given that issues of coexistence are a problem in many secular societies, namely France, Netherlands, Germany, et cetera, can secular public ethics be a solution for moderate Islamic movements? I'm not, and if that's something you want to comment on. Is there an Islamic alternative or contribution on this? In other words, can we, can we look at, the, at these more universal form of public ethics to enable us to coexist uh, as Muslims, given the problems that happen even in non-Muslim societies? Does that make sense to you, the question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the, the notion that secular ethics, that there is a secular ethics, first, as Dr. Esposito was saying, is like, what does that mean? You know, ethics divorced of religious input or metaphysical claims, like, what does that, uh, I mean, you know, that can be interpreted a thousand times over, but, you know, I, I think certain assumptions that political Islam is inherently more violent or dangerous than secular order need to be questioned and challenged. Um, and I'm, I'm doing this just so that we're, we're blunt and honest about this, right? Look, look at the conversation around Iran, right? I was part of a dialogue group behind closed doors where someone from the American political establishment who's very well placed um, was there to argue for tightening sanctions on Iran. And I was the only person in the room um, who, you know, A, was familiar with the region, B, hailed from the region ethnically, and C, um, appeared to have any sense of ethics. Um, <laughs> you know, and he began, you know, just making nonsensical arguments, each of which I was sort of batting away, until I realized that he was basically an evil person. <laughs> and I'm being serious. This is in Washington, D.C. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I'm, like, I, I want us to understand this, because, you know, he said, well, we can't trust the Iranians with, with, with a nuclear uh, capacity because, you know, they're irrational. And I said, well, if they're irrational, why wouldn't they start the apocalypse before they have nukes? And, you know, he kind of, he stumbled and he said, well, you know, I guess it's like there's outpatient irrational and there's like inpatient irrational, so there's, <laughs> there's, there's um, scales. You know, and, and then, you know, he, he began to sort of say, you know, what we need to do is, is squeeze the Iranian regime. And, and I said, and I thought this was a brilliant counterpoint, I said, look, you know, let's say you start squeezing the Iranian regime really hard. You've got a country of about 75 million people and the government fragments, implodes, loses control, something like that, what happens, right? And, and I said, what if you have a civil war like Iraq? And he literally looked at me and said, I'm fine with that. You're okay with something going on. And you know, I thought my trump card was awesome until I realized he had no conscience. <laughs> and I said, you would be fine with hundreds of thousands of people dying. And he said, I could sleep at night. So at this point, I thought, well, maybe you know, I, I have to try another attack. So I tried a strategic argument. So I said, let's say that the Iranian government loses control of its borders. You've now realized a sovereignty-free zone from Kashmir to southern Lebanon. And he was like, well, that's interesting. And there was like a pause. I said, you know, if you think the folks who are rolling around Syria are crazy, like wait till like people from Pakistan start rolling through. I was like, because we have like an extra like hundred million people that we need to kind of like push over. Like we're just like just you know just drive them away, like build a highway in that direction, and like don't come back. Um, a friend of mine on Twitter wrote, "Let's change the name of the country while they're gone, so they can't find their way back." Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's easy to use categories in these conversations, and I, I want us to be cautious of that. You know, it, it's much more what are we advocating for, right? The logic that we cannot trust a regime because it is theocratic when the only country to ever use nuclear weapons twice on civilian targets is a secular democracy, ours, is the height of absurdity. And this is never pointed out in public conversations in Iran, that the Iranian regime may not be particularly irrational for fearing that the United States, the only country to have ever nuked another country, we'll do it again. wants to deny it the ability to theoretically, if that is, you know, their stated intention or, you know, unstated intention. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and I think these are the sort of things that we have to intervene in conversations, not from the grounds of secular, religious, Muslim, not Muslim, just to create an ethics that really preaches universal human dignity. <laughs>
that really understands the claims of others and our own and creates a basis for a human morality that actually accords people the right to live with the privileges that we enjoy. So, thank you very much. Um, actually, well, before we have, uh, get final remarks from uh, Professor Mavani and Professor Esposito, I want to remind you all about the uh, envelopes for donations for MPAC. I think uh, this notion of human dignity has really probably been the one thing uh, that we have learned from Dr. Hatud, both Dr. Maher Hatud, Dr. Hassan Hatud, Eliard Hamo, and all of those who have been leaders in our own community is reminding us of the verse that said, uh, we, we bestow dignity on the children of Adam. And so even if it's not in the form of a formal, structured Islamic government, what we are talking about as a community are general principles of dignity and freedom and justice that need to be applied wherever we are, whether it's as part of a secular democracy or whether it's part of a country that is trying to look at Islam having a more formal role. Um, so with that said, I'm going to ask the last two speakers, if you would, with your final comments, to give us some words that might leave us with a sense of hope about the future, not necessarily of political Islam, but of, say, Muslims' um, aspirations for a better future politically. Let's look at it that way. So I'll start with you, Professor Mavani, and then we'll go to Dr. Sita. Yes. Um, I think I stand between you and the nice dinner that's awaiting you. So. <laughs> I know that you want us to be brief. I think it is very uh, appropriate for me to end on this notion of uh, universal human dignity. You know how beautiful the Quran is. It talks about human dignity at a universe. It says, لَقَدْ karramna bani Adam." Mm -hmm. Very important verse. It says, we have given nobility to the children of Adam, period. Doesn't talk about Muslim, doesn't talk about non-Muslims, doesn't talk about sinful people, it is a universal call. Lakad karamna bani Adam, all children of Adam are ennobled. And therefore, the moment you start developing a hierarchical status of rights, rights of citizens are different depending upon your religion, upon your ethnicity, upon your color, etc. You are violating this universal code. The Quran says we have given universal dignity to everyone, period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a number of years ago, I was asked to speak to the former uh, head of the government in Singapore. And um, I came in and he said, I have, I don't know, four questions, eight questions. But the first question he asked me, and I've never had a government official ask me this, was what is it about Islam that attracts people to it? And, and I would say the real question is if I started to single out different people in the audience, how comfortable would you be or even confident that you could answer that? even though you might believe that Islam is a perfect way and a perfect faith. So for me, the, the challenge for your community, carrying on the tradition that the Hatut brothers and Fatih Osman brought here, um, is to both drill down even deeper in defining your Islam as American Muslims, and I think that's the great contribution that they made, and then realizing that in many ways you provide an example to other parts of the Muslim world, which now in a war-torn situation, uh, that's not gonna be noticed. But the fact is that there has been an impact, which I will not go into now, uh, that has been made by many Muslims who've written in America, traveled overseas and spread that message. With regard to the situation in the Muslim world, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but as one friend said to me, that could just be an oncoming train. <laughs> and so I think that the real thing there is to really be ready to think about all of those universal norms that are true, that you share in America with people of other faith, 
and also that ought to be true throughout the Muslim world. In many ways, if you talk about the status of Muslims, their educational level, uh, the, the rights of women, et cetera, here, it's, it's, it's out of sync with many places in the Muslim world. So in many ways, you can be part of that reformist mood you know, as one moves forward, because there is the space and freedom here to think. Much as I think Ganushi grew in many of the movements because they had that space you know, um, in Europe. And I want to thank you all again for inviting me. And I like the thing about the handkerchief and give me $200. I'm going to try that one. But seriously now, those of you that are going to the dinner, if you come to my table and drop off your credit cards, I can guarantee you'll get a higher place in heaven. <laughs> I'd like to uh, thank, all, thank our panelists for a very rich discussion. I hope you will agree with me. It's been really uh, thought provoking provocative in so many ways, um, stimulating. Uh, it gives us a lot to think about going forward. And it shows really how um, we as a community are at the forefront of taking on some of the most difficult topics and, and addressing them in a way that is intelligent um, and respectful. And so again, I want to thank all of you very much for being here this evening. And uh, I want to thank you, our audience. And uh, salam alaikum.